Welcome everyone, friends from the past, rivals, uh, and uh, generally everyone who's here. Thank you for coming. I'm sorry we're one minute late. We do try and start our first Wednesdays on time, and we will end on time. We know you're very busy. And we do run it as a public meeting, so that uh, we'll, I'll get everyone started. But then it's not wait till the end, it's please contribute early. And uh, we want to hear your questions to our panel, get a briefing from them, and if necessary, take issue with them. Uh, and by, by all means, enjoy the public discussion. Um, we've decided to break it up into a sections, and you know, by all means, uh, you know, influence us as it gets going. But we'd start with Libya, asking about the intervention. Then we're going to uh, also talk about specifically about Saudi Arabia in a, in a third section of the evening. But in the middle, we'll talk about Syria, Yemen, and Bahrain together. And we'll look for inside, and we'll look for some foreign policy messages as well. So that's quite enough from me, uh, but welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. Now, if I could ask our panel to introduce uh, itself, uh, starting with Faraj, who's uh, on my left, if you'd kindly tell us who you are, although I know you were born in Benghazi. Yes, I am. Um, my, my name is Faraj Najm. I'm, um, I'm originally from Benghazi. Uh, I've been self-exiled for the last 28 years in this country. Um, I'm a writer, but also a historian. Um, looked into uh, the tribal makeup of Libya and uh, tried to make sense of it, and still trying. Welcome. Where are you going in two weeks? Uh, I'm going to Saudi. Well, not two weeks. Uh, Sunday, I'm going to Cairo. Then I'm going to Saudi Arabia, which is an interesting place to watch out for, because the rage in the Middle East, I think, it's just not going to stop in Libya or Syria or Yemen. It's just going to go on, and this is something that we should really watch for, but also treasure. Thank you for coming. Uh, no. Yes, I've been living and working on the Middle East, uh, you know, on the Middle East for uh, since uh, about 50 years, actually. Uh, I did my PhD in Libya when it had a king. Um, uh, but I, I, Long time I'm ago. <laughs> yes, I'm chairman of Media Associates, which is a consultancy company. I have, I've been uh, an academic businessman and uh, a diplomat. And I should say your full name is Dr. Noel Brahoni. That's right. Uh, and um, your specialism is Yemen because... Well, I've just written a book on Yemen, which was published last week, right. on, on, on southern Yemen. Right, so you've yeah. seen that we've got a pattern here, Libya, Yemen. Uh, now, to yourself, Barak. Hi, I'm Barak Sina. Alas, in contrast to the other two, there are no patterns that can be drawn. I'm the Middle East Fellow at the Royal United Services Institute and was one of the founders of the Henry Jackson Society that is Westminster-based. That was my previous life, but now based at Rusi. And in your entire life, yes. has the West's foreign policy ever been so severely tested for an entire region of the world since the collapse of communism? I think that now we're facing a new, not only a new landscape in the Middle East, but a moment where new paradigms of thought are going to be constructed um, in terms of how we're going to perceive and promote foreign policy. You're saying yes, really, aren't you? Yes. That's right. You see, that's what we've got, a foreign policy expert here. We got there, it was a sentence, but we knew what we were. But you're very welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, now, last time Jane addressed us at the Frontline Club, she, uh, club, she had a job with The Economist. Jane Kinnamont, where are you now? Uh, I'm now Senior Research Fellow on the Middle East and North Africa programme at Chatham House, uh, a foreign policy focused think tank based here in London. And I just returned from Kuwait. Welcome. OK, so bear in mind, it's your turn in just a second. Uh, but would you all address, uh, perhaps in, in a couple of minutes in turn, and uh, where, you, where you need to disagree, was the intervention in Libya justified? I think it was. I think um, we have a regime which has been, for the last 42 years, a, a regime that um, does not like the word democracy. Uh, it has denied its people personal freedom, but also development. It has pillaged the country's riches, but also a regime which is not just lethal to its own population. We saw what he did in Lockerbie, UTA, uh, the French airplane over Niger, but also invading Chad, causing too many problems to neighbors, Tunisians, Egyptians, uh, Saudis, uh, a regime that even um, um, uh, sponsored a coup in Fiji, which is next to Australia. Uh, so it's a regime which is uh, very dangerous. And what's dangerous about the regime, it isn't the father who has set up this regime, it's the seven sons who have taken over. 
And there's and a daughter, there, isn't there? Well, there is a daughter. Yeah. Well, she's not dangerous. Well, she is equally. Well, let's, let's say seven and a half. <laughs> you know. Well, it's Ooh, just to annoy because... the women in the room. <laughs> well, I, we'll give you the microphone next. Well, don't worry. I, 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 I think women are wonderful, and I don't think. Uh, I don't think she's. Keep, a, keep digging. <laughs> I, I don't think. I think she's a she's a man in a in a in a, in a woman's shape, but um, uh, very dangerous, by the way. And she's the one who said that. Um, that Switzerland that treated her brother b badly should be nuclearized. <laughs> so that kind of woman that uh, we need to address. But anyhow, um, it's, it's, it's a very dangerous regime. And it's, uh, the danger does not, does not stop with the father, but also it goes on with the sons as well. And I'm sorry if, if I appear facetious. When you left the country, was it partly because you feared for your life? No, no. I was sponsored to come to study in this country here. But I, uh, I knew that uh, there was no place for me. <coughs> if I had stayed in Libya, I would have been either massacred in the Abu Salim prison or maybe imprisoned or exiled. Um, no, the question is, was, was the intervention justified? Yes, it I was. Think, sorry, 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 yes, yeah. yes, I think it was. Um, and we also have the, the, the UN and the European and uh, Arab League uh, acquiescence in it, if I put it that way. Um, but I had slight reservations about it, and I had slight res reservations about where it's going, because one of the things I've seen, as I say, I've, been, I've seen the regimes established in the Middle East that we're talking about and, and lived through them. And one has seen a series of strong men really creating regimes built around very big... Uh, uh, security and military systems, um, co-opting elites beyond it, and, you, and the regimes are extremely large and very powerful. And I don't think they will simply collapse because of intervening. It'll, it, it's a lot of hard work. Look, look at what it took to get Iraq. I mean, that's the sort of scale it required to, for, for these regimes to be uh, to, to be overthrown. So I think one has to be. Yes, it's right because there's clearly going to be a problem in Benghazi. But I'm not sure where we go go from here. You're not sure. What I'm not sure. Are you, are you mostly pessimistic about the direction from here? I, I I'm pessimistic simply because I think it's, a, it's going to be an immensely difficult task, I think, unless you know, the pressure is such that, we, you know, that people start peeling off the regime. I think that it was legitimate, not due to consensus, but because the legitimacy derives from the human rights considerations in and of itself. I don't think endless, boring legal processes um, is a legitimizer. Um, Perhaps post facto, one can always tap into it to bolster one's position. But as a very simple human being with a regard for human rights, that kind of speaks for itself. And we can't go around saying the mantra that po politics is not local but global and avert your eyes to human rights abuses elsewhere in the world. And is it significant that there are really no uh, Arab countries supplying military aid in form of the airstrikes? It looks, does it not, like another Western boys club marching into an Arab country? Well, I think that the Arab support has been largely symbolic. That's my point. But is it, it, is it a problem for them that they can't get... If it's such about human rights, why, are there, why is there no human rights protection from Arab countries? Because human rights values does not emanate from Arab countries. It emanates from Western liberal countries. So it would be bizarre if repressive leaders in the Arab world would be applying a human rights rationale for a no-fly zone in Libya. And I'm coming to you next in the room. You might want to take issue with what you're hearing on the, from everyone. And to you, Jane, is it justified? Is it, uh, is it justified intervention? Well, I, I feel after hearing everyone else that I should say no for the sake of balance. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, reluctantly, I, I would say that I think this was a, a clear-cut case of humanitarian intervention, if ever you can have one. Um, however, I think we do still need to worry. I'm not so sure that the West records on supporting human rights in the Arab world is at all convincing. Um, it is not very long since we were allies with Gaddafi and selling him weapons. So I do think there should be more of a focus on not propping up the Gaddafis and the Saddam Husseins of the future. Artillery computers, combat shotguns, tear gas, military cargo vehicles, ground vehicle, military communications. This is what we sold to Gaddafi. Mm -hmm. Command communications, control and intelligence equipment, infrared and thermal imaging technology, crowd control ammunition and small arms ammunition. Who made that policy in London? 
I mean, who, who are the people who make this? I thought the Foreign Office was meant to be largely a sort of uh, Arabist run, mm -hmm. but clearly it's not, is it? Well, I mean, this was part of the overall deal with bringing Gaddafi back into the fold several what, years selling, ago. Selling him uh, t crowd control technology. And I'm certainly not here to, to defend that, but there was an argument made that as a price for giving up his nuclear program, he would then be able to have normal relations with the West, including right. buying arms. So did, um, do you think we traded his denial of nuclear technology with lots of ways to control his population, uh, new weapons, infrared? That wasn't available to him a few years ago. No, I, I, I wouldn't look at the question that way at all. I mean, I think it was a major deal to get the uh, the uh, uh, WND removed from from Libya. And a success, they had to a success of Western foreign policy. A very success. A success. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, can I can just, yes, can you please do. Yes. One, um, two. I think that an Arabist foreign office, if you want to call it that, um, doesn't at all contradict cozying up to dictators in the Middle okay, East. Okay. We're just getting started. To you, then, don't look at it. Please talk into it real okay. well. Um, just because we talk about patents and on, I think the story with the, the government policy on supplying um, regimes with stuff kind of repeats itself because similar stuff happened in Iran. The uh, UK supported the Shah. They supported, they sold uh, CS gas to crowd control and so on. That's why this is kind of second time. At least, from my knowledge, happens there. That's why... You're not surprised by it? No. Right. Could you pass it to this gentleman here? Hello. Uh, Richard Turbot. Um, I think we're all concerned about mission creep. How will we know when we have mission accomplished in Libya? And just an aside on some other, another statement you said. Um, um, the UNHRC, should there be any Arab seats on that council? Right, let's break it up. Two questions. When will we know? Um, for, let's take it in order. When will we know first on the mission accomplished, Faraj? I think with Gaddafi's gun, this is the. When obviously, we know that the regime is. Uh, the, the, the mission is done, is accomplished. Um, <clears throat> just going back to the uh, supplying Gaddafi with arms uh, and. and, and to twin it with the with your question, uh, to accomplish the mission, I think we need to uh, to uh, to uh, to arm the uh, the opposition, the the interim government, the legitimate government. The government now speaks for these people in Benghazi. They're asking for uh, they're not asking for boots in the ground. They said, okay, well you've stopped Gaddafi's uh, using his airplanes and so on. Now we can ask for arms to defend ourselves or to free our brothers in Misrata and Tripoli to rise up peacefully and, and speak their minds. So it's people here wanting arms rather than in the old times, you know, despotic regimes procuring arms, using people's money. So this is what we need to do. Um, I think you're, you're, you're asking about Mission Creep, because that's not in UN 1973, is it? Mm -hmm. So why, why do you want them to remove Gaddafi? Well, it's, no, the, 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 the whole thing, the, this revolution, this uprising, it's all about regime, ch regime change. No, it's not. It's about, well, it's no, about no, protecting civilians. Well, civilians wanted, to, well, the civilians wanted to change the regime. But it's not in the UN resolution. No, but you need to defend us to change the man. To get rid of him? No. It's, it's no. as simple as that. Well, I think the, the question you asked is the right one. I mean, uh, the, the, the UN resolution is very clear. It's to protect civilians. And I don't know when we're going to achieve that. We won't know. Well, I mean, asked... ideal regime change would be, the, would, you know, would be the answer perhaps most people want. But I don't know whether that's achievable, certainly if, in if the, the short term. If the attacking Tripoli, uh, yes. civilians will need protection. Mm. Yes. yes. Well, the, 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 the rebels, they're not saying that we're going to attack Tripoli. We, they're going to stop Gaddafi's brigades from coercing people from coming out to the street and speaking their mind. After all, these oppositions, they were peaceful protesters. They came out, you know, uh, with, with no arms whatsoever. And, and Gaddafi, he's the one who started shooting at them. Let's hear from uh, the two other panel members. You keep the microphone to you, but You can't have it both ways. You can't worship at the altar of consensus in the same way that President Obama does, and at the same time have coherence. If you look at Resolution 1970 and 1973, it's essentially a fudge in order to create the lowest common denominator for all actors in the international community. The problem with it is how do you define protecting the civilians? Is protecting the civilians decapitating the Gaddafi regime because you could argue quite convincingly that the mere existence of the Gaddafi regime poses a mortal threat to the civilians. And would and you, would you argue that? I would argue that. You? Uh, but the problem is that consensus allows for mission creep because it can be protracted and endless and 
the, sh the tragedy is that in the not too distant future, people will look at um, the no-fly zone and delegitimize the no-fly zone itself because of what consensus in international law has created. Jane, then you can come back. Um, I guess I'm not so anti-consensus. I think uh, it probably is better being done in this way than being a purely sort of US operation. I do think the uh, lack of consensus on the issue of regime change is a real problem. I mean, you mentioned one possible scenario about the rebels attacking Tripoli. What if there's another kind of scenario where you have a, a protracted stalemate? Uh, where, where's the end game? Where's the exit strategy? Clearly, you know, some members of the coalition, particularly the US, do want regime regime change, but they don't have a legal basis for it. And you've got questions, but he wants answers from you, Jane. What, when do we know if it's mission accomplished? I don't think it will be clear. I think there will be arguments over it, because I think if we did have some kind of stalemate, you would have some people arguing mission is not accomplished because we haven't actually taken out Gaddafi and he is a threat. Others would argue otherwise. The consensus would break down. So it's another black hole, like Iraq, Afghanistan. We go on no, and on. No, but for no. the opposite no. reasons. Okay, in turn, Iraq, one, two, three. Yep. For the opposite reasons of Iraq, okay, because it. Iraq didn't have consensus, and that was a black hole. Here, it's precisely because of the consensus that you have the black hole. Iraq, Iraq, Iraq you had uh, you had communities within Iraq um, fighting each other. Uh, and, uh, and there was no consensus. In Libya, in the Arab world, in the Islamic world, in the West, this is a consensus that we should celebrate. I mean, we've never had a consensus like this. I mean, God would be very happy to have a consensus like this. You know, it's, it's wonderful. If I wonder if it's a negative consensus. It's when things get more difficult in three to six months' time whether the consensus will remain. That's, that's my, my concern. Thank you for your question. And to you. Hello, my name is Pablo, and uh, I'm a blogger. Um, I'd like to go back to the consensus. I think uh, taking it one step before, uh, why did the Security Council vote the way it did when we knew that uh, countries like uh, United States, uh, UK, were already involved in, in two unhumanitarian wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. We knew that uh, France was interested in getting involved in some kind of action, which is what is happening now. Uh, we get Russia, that had um, the situation in Chechnya, which was also an anti-humanitarian situation. Uh, so I think we have to go there to understand why this is happening, in particular because it has to do with the new world order, because, which is also a subject of this uh, meeting. Yes. And I wonder if the new world order is designed to uh, uh, eliminate these small regimes that pose a threat to the people that are voting in the Security Council. Right, Pablo, I wonder if the room will allow me to take the, your question as the opportunity to move on uh, to ask. Uh, because the, the, the second bit we were going to ask about was the criteria that the panel's been discussing. Does it apply in Syria, Yemen or Bahrain? And I wonder if you agree that at 20 past seven you're moving us along. We haven't discussed Saudi Arabia. So I, I'm going to take you as an opportunity. I think Pablo's saying if you're also excited about the Libyan consensus, is it going to be intervention in Syria? Is it going to be intervention in Yemen or Bahrain? Is that fair? Is that the area you're in? Yeah, because uh, we are talking about, uh, I think, we are talking about a world order since it's the first time that the people that were in the past against each other seem now to be agreeing in uh, attacking other countries. Okay, right. So will you, will you, will you tell us the possibility, if, given the, what you've said about Libya? Could I start with you, Noel? What's the possibility of intervention in Syria, Yemen or Bahrain? I would have thought no, 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 probably. Um, um, I think, I think it's important, and it's very important, I think, this whole debate to remember that each, we're talking about a number of 19, 20 different countries, and they're all different. And the pace of what's the events in each country it will be different, and the trajectories will be different. I think Saudi Arabia, for example, <coughs> will, will, will come on to that, but it can be very, very, very slow. Um, and in a sense, it's also, uh, there was a consensus on, on, on Libya, um, and there was a very clear situation. Um, I don't know whether we'll see the same in, in Yemen. You know, Yemen is a country I know very well. The, it, You've got the regime, you've got the opposition parties, you've got the, the, the people in the streets, you've got the southerners, you've got the al-Houthi. They all unite again, uh, in wanting to overthrow Saleh, but they're very divided amongst themselves. And any, anything there would, would be very, very messy indeed. Um, uh, Syria is a very, very strong regime. You know, it's been there for a very long time. Uh, and, you know, it, it, 
it, it, it'll have to react to, to some in some way to what's going to happen. And I hope that we can deal with that through through, you know, through diplomatic and other pressure. Because I think that they're all learning, I think, the regimes from each other of what is happening. That's why one's seeing these economic uh, concessions being made and these promises of, of, of political change. I mean, President Assad has promised some some change to the uh, uh, emergency law, a new emergency law. I think it's going to be announced tomorrow. But so. Jane. Yep, I think it's it's a completely different case in every single country, and I don't think the opposition movements in these other countries are calling for Western military intervention in any way, but definitely in both Yemen and Bahrain, the opposition are asking why the West doesn't really seem to be doing anything to rein in their government's response to them. And what's your view? Why do you think that's the case? Given what everyone said on the panel about Libya, why is the West doing nothing in, in uh, Libya and Bahrain? Is it sorry in uh, Yemen and Bahrain? Is, that, is it a fair criticism? I think it is. Yeah. I mean, I think in the in the case of, of Bahrain, basically Saudi Arabia sees uh, the uprising in Bahrain as a direct challenge to its own national security. Uh, the West's uh, newfound love for democracy in the Middle East doesn't really extend to the Gulf, particularly Saudi Arabia, where the old oil interest still holds sway. In Yemen, I think the West is caught more on the back foot. It's been backing Saleh probably for too long. It doesn't quite know what to do next. But the Gulf countries are now talking about mediation there. I think that every, just like what you said, every country is very different and you can't simplistically just draw a common denominator between them. Yemen is like kaleidoscopic in its opposition movements and it's a vacuum of governance. Um, Bahrain is a bulwark against Iran for strategic interests. Um, and I think that policy can be identified in a triad manner. For example, you need to have a fusion of ideals, capacity, and strategic interests. You can't be overstretched. You, it needs to fit into your strategic interests and your ideals. So let's say, hypothetically, you have the luxury of creating a hit list of evil regimes around the world, right? North Korea, Syria, Iran, etc., etc. There's tons of them, right? And um, you have to be pragmatic. What do your resources allow for? Does it fit into your strategic interests? And, you know, God willing, you go on to that sequence and you eliminate one by one, if it was such an orderly world. But alas, it's not. I think Yemen will be problematic because Yemen has sectarian communities. Yemen is, there is a clear split between <coughs> south and north. So it is going to be problematic, not just for the world, but also for the neighboring countries. As for Bahrain, Bahrain, there is a worry. There is a genuine worry that Bahrain might swing towards Iran, who is the enemy of the Gulf state, but also the West. Um, Syria. If, if Syria changes, obviously people are fearing that Syria will be even more radical than what it is right now, especially when it comes to Israel. Good evening. Uh, Ibrahim al from the Libyan-British Relations Council. I would like to go back to something that Dr. Noel said in his introduction, that the str these strongmen regimes with very strong security around them and very well established, they do not necessarily fall when you take out Leader. Please use the microphone, would you? Sorry, yeah. Uh, and that's what we're seeing now, potentially in, in Egypt, where the army are in power and <coughs> elements of the regime are still there, even though Mubarak has been taken out. But we cannot say there is one rule for all the countries in the Middle East and North Africa. Libya is very different. Colonel Gaddafi is the center and focus of his regime and the removal of Gaddafi will cause the regime to unravel. Now, moving on from that point will be a long and difficult challenge, a difficult road. But the Libyan people stood up for freedom. They want the freedom that has been denied them for so many years, and they want to live in a democratic society. So in the case of Libya, the removal of Gaddafi will cause the unraveling of the regime. Mm. But that's not, that's not what the UN's authorised. No, but it does, the fact does remain... No, but. That's your, no, your view okay. is no but. So we can take people away we don't like them. We can do that, can we? The UN resolution does allow, allows, allows for the protection of the civilian population in Libya. The only threat to the population of Libya is the Gaddafi regime. 
He's addressing to you, I think, here. Oh, right, yes, OK. Well, I, I, I take... Uh, well, if you're going back to the one-man point, yes, I mean, I, I, perhaps Libya, you could accept that, but there's the Praetorian Guard, there's the, the army, the security services, the, the Hamis battalions. This is all part of that sort of regime. And all, within all these regimes, there are interest groups which, have, which believe in the survival... The, their own survival depends on the survival of the regime. So I think that they, in many cases they will fight. They may not. I mean, if Gaddafi were removed, it might, well, in Libya. It's likely that a lot of that infrastructure will unravel. Yes, and it might. Gaddafi mm -hmm. has been paranoid of yeah. an uh, attempted overthrow from, from the army mm -hmm. and has systematically weakened the mm -hmm. Libyan army yeah. over decades. So it's not the same as yeah. in Egypt. I think, uh, I think if Gaddafi goes, um, Libya will be a, a good model uh, for the Middle East. Libya is mm -hmm. a, a very cohesive, very homogeneous society. Um, Gaddafi has succeeded in one thing, has cemented Libyans against him. You know, People in the East, for example, who are being accused of being um, separatists and so on, are eager to see Tripoli, the capital liberated and they said we will not celebrate unless the West is, is, is freed from Gaddafi. So there is a genuine uh, consensus on, on the removal of this man and this could be a good example to you, uh, to follow in the future. Right, to you here and to you at the back in a minute. Hi everybody, my name is Ahmed Suwalem. Uh, I'm originally from Benghazi and I just going back to the point where is, when is the end game? I think the end game is has to be, and, and I'm talking not because of the Libyan civilians or the Libyan population, I'm talking about humanity. This man has proven every now and then that he's a threat to the world. And I, ta I say this to my British fellow citizens and the French and the Americans. If this person stays, he will not be a threat to the Libyans. He will target everyone who sided by the Libyan people. Yeah. So what, when I say is if people are questioning when is the end game, it has to be the end of this person. And I mean not even by taking him aside, it's taking his people around him, his kids and his regime altogether. I think Resolution 1973 can include decapitating the Gaddafi regime itself. It because only somebody who is retarded will look at that resolution and say it's simply to, in a symptomatic manner, um, protect um, civilian populations that are threatened imminently by an armoured column that is venturing towards it. James, but do you think really that the ten governments that said yes all did interpret it in that way and thought they were think, giving a mandate I for think, Gaddafi to be assassinated? I think each country interpreted it differently and within each country they interpreted it differently just like Cameron and Liam Fox and the head of the British Armed Forces they all had their own interpretations that that's the beauty of international law, it's far and you can rationalise it post facto however you like. Jane, would you like to come back? I think that that's yeah, that's it really. I'm not. I'm not. Yes. <laughs> I, I think that damaging the consensus will be a problem. There was no consensus anyway. Let's be frank. The the Arab League, after 12 hours of it being put together, criticised the action that the alliance made, even though they knew damn well that Resolution 1973 entailed taking out Gaddafi's air defence systems. Mm -hmm. okay. They knew what that meant. The African okay. Union has been screaming out against it. Well, Turkey, there's well, no real... Well, world Jewish leaders Jewish. made it very clear that Gaddafi must go. I mean, Obama, when he was in Brazil, he said it's our policy that this man should go. Uh, David Cameron said it, Sarkozy said it. Even the Turks, Mr. Gould yesterday when he was in Indonesia, he said Gaddafi, he has no place in, 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 your, uh, in today's world. So, uh, and the Arabs, there is a consensus that this man must go. We must talk about the perceived cynicism of this foreign policy as a, in, a, in a moment, but I'm taking the lead from the, 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 you. Yeah, I'm, so if you don't raise it, I'm going to blame you at the end, not me. I'm William Bates, and, and I'm one of the cynics. I, I think the correlation between human rights and the West is, relates to oil. There's no oil in Syria, so Syrian human rights, well, minimal, I think. It's a, a pipeline area, though. So I think it's uh, unlikely that the, the Western countries will be take, it, take, it, take advantage of the situation. But, but it's a, a serious interest to Turkey and Israel, because if the new black hole becomes Syria, and Syria implodes, and the West is not going to go in, who's going to go in? The Turks go, go in, and that'll be the new Israeli neighbor? 
Or the Israelis go in, that'd be the new Turkish neighbor? Or could the Iraqis even see in their interest, particularly if an Al-Qaeda threat come, uh, comes back out of Syria? Okay, and to you at the back. Hi. <clears throat> this is Pender. So during the time uh, when the uprising was happening on Tahrir Square, William Hague went over to the Middle East and to the region, and he went over to Bahrain and met with the uh, King of Bahrain. And he came back and said, actually, uh, King of Bahrain and the family is a good friend of, of uh, United Kingdom. And also, quote unquote, he said that their views are very much our views. Since then, of course, uh, people have been put down, and there have been an uprising which has been crushed. And um, the King of Bahrain has invited the GCC to come over and uh, help with putting down the people and what is perceived to be a largely Shia uprising. And your point? Uh, the point is, the question is for the panel is, what does that mean about the morality of uh, our foreign policy and the new world order? Do keep the microphone. Sorry to be a bit rude to you. I think it's, a, it's obviously a question we must address. You're comparing everything and asking about morality. Will you go further, give us your view? What's your answer to your own question? Well, my, my hypothesis is that uh, it kind of very much depends. Uh, everybody has a, a foreign policy interest, and they try to implement that. And in the middle, we are trying to kind of dress it up by democracy and freedom and such uh, principles that people kind of it appeals to people. But, be, be, but uh, foreign policy makers don't necessarily believe in it, because if there isn't oil there or if then the interests don't necessarily resonate, well, we're not going to do anything about it, N not even go as fast criticizing it in words. Barack, I think you've come the closest to saying it's simply about our interests. It's not about our values. I said it's a fusion of all the three things. You did say that. And, um, <laughs> and you know, when you look at Bahrain, um, you can't simply look at the Middle East and think, right, there's an uprising going on throughout the Middle East. It's all location specific. And with Bahrain, I wonder the extent of Iranian involvement there. And if there is Iranian involvement, it's not simply a bunch of tree huggers that want rights. This is um, about Iran attempting to extend its sphere of influence. So we can't overlook that. Um, and we can't simply look at it from the present moment in time. I think that Western governments have been wanting not simply because they've maintained the status quo, but they haven't had a transformational approach towards the Middle East and sought to promote liberalization, forget democratization. And it's really ironic. All those who were against regime change under the Bush administration calling it really colonialistic and imperialistic and every other stick that were that existed, um, none of them, and they were the ones that said you need to foster or organic liberal change, they are the ones who today have slashed funds to the opposition movements across the Middle East, whether it be through Egypt to Iran. So I think that whereas we talk the whole time about winning hearts and minds throughout the Middle East, it's actually Iran that's exploiting the fissures and seeking to extend its sphere of influence. This is a failed, not flawed, but failed policy. There is a double standard, certainly. I think most governments uh, and most movements, though, have been showing some double standards. I might allude to the speech of Hassan Nasrallah, where he praised the uprising in Bahrain, along with those in uh, Libya, Tunisia and Egypt, but he's remained pretty silent on the issue of Syria. But I would like to take issue with the views of both the speakers expressed that the issue here is Bahrain being a bulwark against Iran. I've covered Bahrain for, for a few years. I'm writing a book about the country. The mainstream Shia opposition in Bahrain looks to Ayatollah Sistani in Iraq rather than looking to Iran. The party that got 62% of the popular vote in the last election has been consistently calling for a constitutional monarchy, a stronger parliament, an elected prime minister. Since the violence happened in February, more radical opposition groups that do look more towards Fadlallah and towards Khamenei have been calling for an outright revolution. They have not represented the majority Shia population in Bahrain in the past. I think there is a concern that as this quite sectarian crackdown continues, more people could join that radical path. I would also add that the crackdown has included uh, also the arrest of the most prominent Sunni opposition politician in Bahrain, who has been detained now for two weeks with his family, not knowing what charges there are against him, not knowing where he's detained. So I think that there are genuine human rights concerns that the West should be making more of a fuss about. And how do you join the dots? Do you wish that it wasn't double standards, or is that so childish and naive you're telling us to get on with it as it is? 
I think it's understandable that countries pursue their interests, but they have to look hard at how those interests are constructed and to bear in mind that the leaders that they currently deal with may not be there forever. I mean, the US has its major naval base in Bahrain, so it wants to have good relations with the government. But is it really good if a large proportion of the population sees the US as complicit in a crackdown against it? OK, and to you with the tie. Yes, um, going back to the 1970 and 1970 resolutions and their focus on protecting civilians, um, shouldn't uh, there, there are human rights abuses in, in Tripoli right now, happening right now, and people are in danger in Tripoli and uh, the Western Mountain. Shouldn't that be considered part of protecting civilians in Libya? Uh, they're not being uh, bombarded, they're not being shelled, but they're also they're being kidnapped, they're being uh, imprisoned, they're being shot. Uh, it, it, it's all happening in Tripoli as well as other Western uh, uh, areas in Libya. Shouldn't shouldn't the, the protection of this resolution extend to those people? Yes, uh, definitely. I would agree with you. And this is why I say that the, the resolution uh, implies, uh, 1973, implies that Gaddafi should be removed. This is the only way to secure okay, the human rights of those people in the West that um, you've mentioned. We're repeating ourselves a bit. Yes. Does, everyone, does anyone disagree on the panel? No. <coughs> you? And then you, sir. You're next. Um, my apologies. My question actually related to the earlier discussion, but... Um, it moves very quickly up here, you know. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> it better um, be good, this question. In terms of uh, the longer-term issues, um, one of the issues that could come up is the fact that Libya and many other Middle Eastern countries have very little history or uh, culture of democracy. And uh, if you compare it to the current situation in the Ivory Coast, a country which similarly has had a very short history of having any de democratic uh, government, uh, do you think that the removal of Gaddafi will necessitate a successful um, democratic country? Or could he just be replaced with another strong man, or turn to be a corrupt or broken democratic regime? No. Well, I think, uh, in, the, sorry, in the particular case of, of Libya, I think if you remove that regime, then you, the, the trouble is he's really destroyed everything else. And you know, in other countries, you do have uh, 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 p potential institutions. It's difficult to see what will come in Libya, except what's coming from the street now. And maybe the, the technocrats and the, and the people in exile that might be able to go back. But the, the particular way Libya's been run through this basic people's councils, general people's councils, it's, 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 it lacks any institution. So I don't see what, I think whatever's going to happen is going to be very difficult. It's going to be a, a difficult coalition, very difficult to get people together. Uh, I mean, I'm sure my friend would uh, like to comment I, on that. Uh, uh, obviously, <laughs> I, I follow the situation in Libya very closely. Uh, over the last five weeks, it's amazing how things evolved. For example, in the East, in Benghazi in particular, spontaneous demonstrations, people speaking their mind, um, uh, newspapers, um, uh, uh, even the man who's now been charged with the, with the with the media, the Ministry of Media, he said once Gaddafi is removed, I'm going to resign because we're not going to have a minister. We're just going to have free media. Uh, so. The, 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 the democratic fever is catching on. And people are learning very, you know, we know we live in a new age whereby we interact with each other quicker, you know, through, because don't forget this revolution started with Twitter and, and Facebook by young people. So it's, it's catching on. I didn't think it would be a problem at all. It's still going to be organized. I mean, this is the, it's difficult, I think, yeah. you're finding in, in Yemen, you know, there are 31 different groups in the street. Uh, they formed a coalition yes. in Egypt. You've got this coalition. And it was the, uh, it was the revolutionaries in Egypt were uh, uh, advocating voting against the referendum on constitutional change, so they had, could have time to recognise. And 77% of the Egyptian population actually voted against that. Uh, That's another interesting point mm. in terms of the demographics mm. of the region, how representative are the people running the revolution. I think, um, it's, I think it's really mm. remarkable mm. that um, when, in, in the initial stages of um, the uprising against Gaddafi, everybody said, oh my God, what efficient society. Gaddafi successfully created divide and rule tactics, mm. and he spent all all his time doing that against tribal leaders. Um, and once he goes, it's going to be a civil war like Somalia. And I found it really fascinating to see how um, the rebel leaders, the Transitional National Council, sought to create a robust civil society and societal cohesion in the law courts in Benghazi. And I think that the only option that the West has is to establish contact 
Arts groups, with um, the tribal leaders, uh, with the Transitional National Council, not only to create a coherent strategy for them, but in order to inculcate liberal values for them. And perhaps in the future, if we arm the rebels, there ought to be strings attached as to what types of ethos do they seek to embrace. Right, we'll come back to Libya at the end, unless your question's about Libya, then we're moving on to Saudi Arabia. But just a small talk. Um, let us take the West as a lecturer or teacher, telling us day and night that Ben Ali, Hosni Mubarak, Ali Abdullah Saleh, they are the best people, they are the nicest people, they are fighting with us, terrorism, blah, 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 blah. And then suddenly overnight, you tell us that they are hell, we want democracy, we want rule of the law. And then um, sometimes you tell us, ah, um, the United Nations changes um, uh, what they did is short of, they are not asking Gaddafi to go, we cannot. We are confused in the area. Mm -hmm. This is well, a terrible double, double standard. Yeah. Every now and then you are coming with a new story. We are not believing you. This is the problem. Thank and what's, what's the standard of the Arab world? They don't like it, but they don't want to do anything about it. Is that well, right? Uh, well, I doubt very much. If the present people who are in Tahrir or in Tunisia or wherever, they will be friends of the West. Look one example. When Clinton went to, to Cairo mm. to visit the Tahrir Square, mm. she, she didn't find any. Why? Okay. This is the question. I'd Why? like to come back on that. Please actually, do. Because, Keep um, the microphone. Have a go. The week before last, uh, I've got my own, uh, but the week before last, I was in Cairo interviewing a lot of young activists from different political groups, and one of the questions I was asking in my research is, what role do you think the West should play here, if any role at all? Um, and actually, I think a lot of people still want to engage with the West. For instance, the Muslim Brotherhood were very unhappy that David Cameron did not meet with him with them during his visit, because they did actually want to meet with him, but they want the engagement to be on completely different terms. Uh, some of them would like to see an apology from the West. Certainly they would like to see Western support in uh, hunting down the assets that have been taken from Egypt and returning those to the state, and they want more of, a, of an equal say. Should there the be an apology, Barrett, from the West? Um, I think that the problem with the West is, I actually don't know how to answer the question, because uh, the West is very much in a position of damned if you do, damned if you don't, because you've got two approaches you can adopt, stability or transformation. The stability is propping up and having engaging with uh, the elites, with regimes, in order to counter... Well, they've certainly tried that in the West, haven't they? But it's not sustainable. And... Um, and so you'll get criticism, oh, you're hypocritical, you've not embraced liberal democratic values when you've kept, up, when you've kept face with these repressive regimes. But then if you um, promote transformation, people will criticise you for being a hawk, for being a colonialist. Um, so um, I don't hear from Western populations, let alone the political leadership, um, what type of ethos should we adopt and can it be sustained? Well, what do you think is the answer to that? What would you like, how would you like to see the West behave? The same rules of law are right here. We want the same rules of law are right here. So you want, you want regime change then? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Way. <laughs> okay, and to okay. you. Hi, my name is uh, Justin from Tripoli. Um, I just have one question. If the mission is accomplished next week and Gaddafi is gone, um, we have too many mercenaries in Libya. What Libyans can do with them? Okay, who wants to handle that? No, the NATO will pull out then, won't it? I, I, th I think we should send them to the ICC. But also, coming back to the apology, the West should apologize to, to us or not. I don't think it's the West, it's the various governments. Certainly, I would like to see Tony Blair. He's a man who hugged Gaddafi, rehabilitated him. Again, with Peter Mendelssohn and people like Gordon Brown, who struck a deal and freed Magrahi and so on. They should come out and tell us why they did it and how much they were earned. Well, I can't, of course, I haven't been a diplomat. I'd have to say this. I mean, you know, you'd have to deal with what's there. I mean, Mubarak was there 30 years. If we started promoting re re regime change 25 years ago, what would happen to our interests? I mean, you know, this is, this is the trouble. You have to deal with the governments that are there with, you know, for all your other interests in your region, your palace, policy towards uh, uh, big Middle East issues. Um, and you can't just wish them away. You, you know, it's, it's, this, this is the reality of the world. Well, we'll wrap up, yes. uh, we'll wrap up this in a second. Yes. But we're coming to Saudi Arabia. Can, mm. Will you 
address our friend's question about armed mil m mercenaries in Libya after Gaddafi? I was in an intelligence briefing. Apparently, there's no more than a couple of hundred there. So <laughs> don't say that they're overrun with mercenaries. There's a couple of hundred. Is this the same intelligence community who told us about weapons of mass destruction in Iran? <laughs> It might be, it might not be, in which case you're lucky. Right, now we're going to move on to Saudi Arabia. If, you're, if your question's not about Saudi Arabia, then you can't ask it. Now, um, will you, can I just take a pause here? You, you, you've been kind enough to address many different issues, and all of us who've come in the room, we wanted a briefing from inside the country, and we wanted your take on foreign policy. And because I'm about to move on to Saudi, would you tell me the, the thing that was missing for you, you didn't get said then, either about the internal situation or about the foreign policy? And if you have said it, please don't feel you have to say anything because we want to talk about Saudi Arabia. We'll go in this direction. So the question is, did you fail to say something about the countries mentioned or foreign policy? And if this is the time, and then we're moving on. I'll wait for Saudi. Thank wait you. For wait for Saudi. Thank you. Same. Lovely. I love it. Now, if you're, is it Saudi Arabia? It's no. Well, we'll come back to you in the closing thoughts. I promise. Man with glasses. I promise. Don't look upset with me. I sorry. Promise. Sorry. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not flirting with you. But you are the most remarkable moderator. Okay. <laughs> So now, yeah, we've been running these for a year as public meetings. So believe me, we do rely on our audience. Thank you. I'll take that. It's the authoritarian approach. Yeah. No. Um, so now we're moving on to, to thank you, Saudi Arabia. The question is. Well, are, if we are now pro-democracy, how does our relationship with Saudi Arabia work? And let's go uh, in this direction, and then to you in the room. Saudi Arabia is a very difficult situation. Saudi Arabia is uh, the way it's governed. It's a deal between the the, the clergy, the uh, the tribal, but, the, but also the Al Saud family, and and it isn't a straightforward case like the way it is in it is in Libya or Egypt or Tunisia. It it takes more than than what happened in Libya. It's it's quite a a big challenge, uh, but there has to be some some sort of reforms. Uh, listen, I haven't recognised the way Saudi Arabia is run. I mean, it's it, it surprising, surprising. There is a consensus system that operates within the, the ruling family and extends within the elite of the country. Um, uh, uh, and there is a con there is a sort of majlis ashura, the constitutional assembly, which is selected, not elected. But the, it, it's a, it's a, it's a move in the right direction. I don't detect in Saudi Arabia. I, mean, I go to Saudi quite a lot. Any real movement there that is uh, protesting against it, and where the protests are, there are protest movements. Though I've certainly seen them on. The the internet and elsewhere. And they're both from the liberal side and from the more conservative side. And I'm not sure <laughs> in which direction, if the reform in Saudi Arabia, which way it would go. Well, there are civil mm. rights um, uh, movements. Yes. Um, movements, yeah. for example, uh, which mm. emanate from within the Islamic, yes. but also the Arabic system. For example, yes. yeah. they think that it's Islamically acceptable for women to drive cars, but it's, mm. it's tribally not acceptable. Yes. So there is this conflict between yeah. what's tribal and Islamic. Mm. Uh, and therefore, I think the Saudis, they are we, we need to help them, but we cannot really push or impose yeah. ourselves on them to, 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 to create uh, so, 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 some sort of mechanism whereby uh, Saudi Arabia just modernizes and goes forward. But you told us at the beginning that it's, it's all eyes on Saudi Arabia. It's going to happen there. It is because issues such as, for example, women driving is something very big in Saudi Arabia. I think and, and if this happens, I mean, by Saudi standard, I think it's a revolution. I think we have a very long time planning in Saudi Arabia. Mm. I don't think we should assume because something's happened in Tahrir Square <laughs> or Tunis, it's going to happen everywhere else, as I don't think it will. It, 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 may, it may find elements in Saudi Arabia, but it'll take a very, very long time but for change. we can finally. tell that the government in Saudi Arabia it, yes. has been worried yes. about this risk. If we look at oh, the yes. actions they've taken, the day of rage was declared there on, I think, the 11th of March. Police were heavily deployed throughout the major cities. A lot of the regime-supported clerics came out saying protesting is un-Islamic, it will lead to chaos or worse, communism. Uh, they, of <laughs> course, have announced two large public spending packages this yes. year already, um, the first one being $37 billion. They're increasing the size of the religious police, etc. So I think the regime is aware that there's pressure there. They're trying to solve it with economic quick fixes. The fact that the, the leadership is ageing and they've got their own problems around succession makes it extremely difficult for them to actually reform, and I think that is a worry. Is a pro-democracy uprising likely in Saudi Arabia? I don't think so. I think the opposition is too fragmented. I think the, the liberals and the Islamists are scared of each other, and I think the different regions uh, also have quite different movements of their own. However, we would have said all these things about Tunisia uh, a year ago. Mm. 
Um, I would I would agree with your analysis 100%. Um, the problem with it that the United States is doing is it's creating a security architecture which is underpinned by Saudi Arabia. Mm. That it has kind of second qualitative edge in the region, but first qualitative edge in the Gulf, um, and the GCC uh, with Saudi Arabia underpinning it is seen as a bulwark against Iran. Um, I think that if the international, well, if the United States is going to be supplying Saudi Arabia with weapons, it can demand liberalization, liberal reforms being introduced, and it can pressurize them. Um, I think the greatest threat to Saudi Arabia is not um, the protests in the street, but the aged leaders that are either ill, demented, or just really old and about to die any minute. Uh, but that, that really is, and there's a succession problem. That's the, uh, and that's, I think it's the implosion from the leadership, not from the grassroots. I simply don't agree with that. Um, <laughs> um, there is there is a succession issue because of the, the aging leadership, but there's also a process for, for dealing with it. And I think it's pretty clear who's going to come next, and fairly clear who's going to come after it. I mean, I don't. So, uh, and there is a consensus. I mean, it's important to keep in mind there is a consensus within Saudi Arabia. It, it is. It's. It's. It's a consensus set by the king. So in that sense, it, I'm not, I'm not suggesting it's democratic, but it's set by the king. Uh, and it, so it, the personality of the king may well affect which, whether it's more liberal or more conservative. It could go in that direction or this direction. But, but I think there's a consensus within the, the family and within the elite about the general direction. And I agree entirely. I, I think they were. I think these are preemptive measures. I think they saw what was happening around the region and took uh, preemptive measures, particularly to deal with the um, sort of thing, the economic problems we haven't talked about. Because I, I, Saudi University lecturers have been saying to me for years, you know, we are seeing the youth bulge coming through the universities. And what we're worried is what's going to happen when they get out, mm -hmm. because there aren't jobs. And, and, uh, and because they can't get jobs, it will delay the age of, age of marriage. And that's when you'll see anger. So um, go on then. What, what you, mm. You're saying Saudi Arabia is going to change in 10 years, but not because of women's rights, because of economic rights. I think it'll be economic. I think it'll just be. It'll be a, be a very slow process. I think it'll be. That, that's the way it works. Um, it'll be a slow process. Mm. It's interesting to watch the Saudi mm. media, for instance, look at the Arabia, for example, which is competing mm. with Al Jazeera mm. and cheering on the mm. revolutions throughout the Arab world mm. and, and standing up for the people and their rights and so on. And, and that's, that should um, encourage or should um, uh, motivate Saudis uh, to, uh, to, to, to reform from within, I think. Uh, we, we need to leave them at their own pace. Because Saudi Arabia is a, is a very uh, a particular case because of the holy places and so on. So it's, it isn't as straightforward like Libya or Tunisia. But who defines what their own pace no is? No one. <laughs> well, the Saudis. Very the Saudis. Yeah, but those Saudis have very different views on what that pace should be. Well, speaking to Saudis from all sorts of you know persuasions and walks, uh, and and I mean I, I was very uh, uh, stunned when I spoke to some liberal Saudis, and they said that uh, the system that we have in here sh must must not be um, changed. We, we we need to keep it because this is the way that we you know we are kept together. But many of those people are calling for a constitutional monarchy publicly. I mean, there's been uh, two major petitions this year calling for a constitutional monarchy. Well, it's, so it's, maybe that's not an outright change yeah. of system. Well, it is, it is a minority who are yes. calling for yeah. this, and, but this might catch yeah. on. We don't know. I don't see why we this have... This is why it's interesting. I don't see why we have to play ball, and I think that the... Um, for example, we saw with the Bush administration's war in Iraq, there were slight ripple effects that happened through the region, and for um, Saudi Arabia to have municipal elections, or you have the first female broadcasters on the news, you know, that's big stuff there mm. in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> so I wouldn't say... I wouldn't say... Um, maintain, you know, respect um, them because they have the religious rights. And I also don't subscribe to a, a moral equivalence. And it, it sounds arrogant, perhaps it is arrogant, but coming from the West that respects liberal human rights, we are superior societies to those that don't. And therefore we shouldn't respect regimes or societies that fail to um, embrace basic human rights and liberal values. How superior are we? <laughs> very. Well, this is, I mean, this I mean, is very controversial. This is a, <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, I mean but, but, I, I, again, to... That's what born the radicalization. Again, to claim... Okay, we'll just take a quick comment from, the, from the, everyone who's... Exactly, asked. this belief that we're a superior society actually radicalized people. Because we, we don't sorry, understand. What? I, understand. I think I our belief 
that we are superior society actually radicalize people in poor countries or people which yes. don't see we we don't understand them then we forcing our society on them I and they have, have no other have option just to believe in God in Why something Why should I have belong. empathy towards people that because seek you don't understand to deny them. women's rights, that seek to persecute homosexuals, and that speak about infidels, whether they be Christians or Jews? <laughs> These are that have um, that are repressive in every sense of the word. There is no reason why. We, I should be respecting them. No, you, you don't need to respect that part. But we don't need to force all our culture on them because us, we, we don't want they to force our culture hey, on them. There's a gentleman over sure. there that said they want over there what we have over here. We're not doing any imposition. No, no I, I, I think it's actually what he said. It's you, you're actually you're playing to the hands of the extremists when you say we are superior, we are better than you are. And obviously there are lots of people over there who say, well, stuff you, you know. In a society <laughs> where you have freedom of choice and when your autonomy and rationality is respected, is that not superior to a society that denies you that? Well, no, yes no, or no? No, 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 no This isn't no, international no, law. No, society that's denying you that. Right. Let's break it down. Let's break it down. Panel, will yeah. you respond? to this controversy first and we'll come to you now in the front. Well, I'm just going to steal his comments, I think. Mm, when saying okay. uh, you were talking about the regime, not about the society. I agree. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, there are many very brave women's activists and human rights activists in the Arab world that, that are literally risking their lives. I mean, well, I'm conflating societies with regimes. So Incorrectly, societies. you're right. I'm talking about regimes. Our Governments then are superior to those regimes. Right. Now, we'll just take, let's go around the room on this. Is your question about superiority of values, yeah. either of you? Yes. Yes. Um, seems to me that there's a lack of historical perspective in in that statement because it's only very, very recently that one could have made these claims. The history of the British Empire, for example, uh, I don't think would substantiate that that argument. So um, I'm uh, h highly sceptical. Uh, uh, I'd like to say lots of things about uh, other aspects of it, if I may, just very briefly. Um, the, it seems to me that the, the whole discussion here is, is a little too narrow. Uh, uh, someone that did, uh, did mention about the New World Order, and, and that, of course, is a, a relevant factor. Um, I think there's an enormous amount of his hypocrisy. The idea that, that we are only there for humanitarian reasons, it just doesn't stack up. Uh, the, it, that it is uh, c continuing the uh, historical imperialist uh, Western um, uh, attempt to uh, control the, the resources of these uh, regions and, and countries, which is <coughs> uh, <coughs> sorry. Um, which is the underlying thing, and it is only overlaid by uh, some genuine uh, concern for uh, human rights. And the final point, uh, a gentleman there, whose name I didn't catch because I came in late, um, was talking about human rights earlier on, and surely that is the precise uh, link between all these disparate countries and regimes and so on. If we're talking about human rights, then that is the crucial thing which we should be... Un applying universally. Right, and just keep the microphone if you would. Do you, would you have gone in to Libya to say Benghazi was about to be shelled, that's what people think, when the airstrikes struck? Would you, was it, are you supporting the airstrikes? Quite frankly, I don't know. I, I hate the idea uh, of, uh, of humanitarian rights being uh, preserved by bombing and killing other people, even though those other people are not very pleasant themselves. Yeah. Uh, and, and I'm not really sure whether there was an alternative, though I, I because I'm not sufficient of an expert, I, I, I feel that there ought to be an alternative. Mm. So, uh, the, the International Criminal Court, for example, uh, it was mentioned once, and, uh, and if, uh, if the leaders had been uh, very clearly indicted to appear before the International Criminal Court, I think that might have deterred some of the actions. OK. And to, uh, to you at the back? Uh, yeah, just following on from the superiority of societies, I'd imagine that in Mr. Seymour's superior society, we've done away with all retards based on his earlier comments. <laughs> but I'm just curious to know uh, how the panel That's reconciles themselves yeah. with the fact that uh, all of us, based on our pensions, etc., benefit from companies such as BAE Systems. 
Right, so arms sales is supporting a broader economy in our well, country? Not, yes, pretty much everyone's pension. Okay, so we're coming to you um, uh, with the, the with next, next, and you next, but we'll just answer this gentleman's question. The arms sale question, we're here to ask about foreign policy. I, I've got some figures here. Bahrain, assault rifles, components for combat aircraft, small arms ammunition, submachines, guns, weapon sites, aircraft cannon, shotguns, rifles, sniper rifles, hand grenades, smoke hand grenades, stun grenades, smoke ammunition, smoke canisters, tear gas and riot control agents sold by the UK to Bahrain between January 2009 and September 2010. Were we right to sell them those, Farage? I don't know. I, I don't think the um, uh, democratic governments should sell weapons to uh, undemocratic governments. That's a lobby. A lobby. Who should we sell? Them? Well, <laughs> so this is the gentleman's question. He's still got the topic. Who should we sell them to? Sell them to us, the rebels. <laughs> we'll pay you. Well, Saudi Arabia buys quite a lot, doesn't it? I mean, it keeps BA a lot of BA jobs going. So yes, this part, one of, it's just part of our interests, and uh, you know, I think we, 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 we will continue to sell arms. And it's, I'll it's just make happen. a parenthetical. Alternatives. Yes, but, he has an engineer. Yes, all right. Fine. I, 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 you can. Uh, that's a philosophical. I mean, you know, that's a different issue. But we, you know, we can get into that. But it's. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm going to only make a parenthetical point, mm. and your question does imply uh, superiority because you have a great consciousness of who we in the West sell weapons to, but you make no mention of the fact that Libya and Syria have. Russian yeah. owned weapons, and perhaps you take it for granted that these autocratic regimes uh, will be receiving weapons from more repressive regimes. Perhaps you take it for granted that you're not applying that question universally. No, I'm not going further than that. Jane? No leaps of thoughts. I mean, you mentioned the arms sales to Bahrain. I know the UK government has revoked over 40 arms licences mm. uh, because of the way that some of those weapons have been used in Bahrain. I would still ask what exactly they thought that things like tear gas were going to be used for. <laughs> what do you think they would be used for? If they'd rung you up, what no, would you No, it's pretty said? obvious. I mean, Bahrain does... Some of its weapons purchases are clearly designed against a potential threat from Iran. For example, it bought a huge missile defence system from Lockheed Martin a couple of years ago. Where you're looking at riot control equipment, uh, that is more clearly designed for use against uh, internal protests, which they've had a lot of over recent years. Uh, and for people who are interested in foreign policy, the gentleman's question, he doesn't like the arms trade, mm -hmm. but is it part of our national interest to sell arms? Is, is that, is that an, a, a, a relevant question? I'm quite sceptical about it, about the pure economic benefits. I don't quite know how it stacks up when you take into account the kind of subsidies, the cost of, of lobbying overseas for arms sales, etc. I mean, I think basically when governments such as the Gulf government of buying arms for the UK, part of what they're doing is actually buying political influence. Often they're buying arms that are not realistically going to be used, but essentially they become very important markets, sources of British jobs and so on, and, and that helps them to buy some is, influence. Is, isn't it in ironic capitals. that um, those autocratic governments are supplied arms by democratic governments? I mean, in the last two or three weeks, mm -hmm. Gaddafi has received Israeli weaponry. <laughs> via a Palestinian middleman. Right, to you, you, which is very interesting. To you first, then you. Um, can I just ask a pan? I, I think the crux of the problem seems to be that um, it, 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 it seems to the people in the Middle East that the only options are um, either being a pariah state, anti Western, like Iran, or having leaders who are regarded as stooges of the West. Uh, whereas I think what they want, and I think what this whole movement shows, is that they actually want a genuine democratic state that is not backed up by the West, that is not a, a, a dictatorship. They just want a plain, simple democracy. And, and the problem is that they, they, they can't trust the West. Uh, they, they can't believe that the West genuinely wants democracy there. Um, because historically, they've shown that, for example, in Iran, when, when there was a democracy, uh, Mossadegh, they toppled. They toppled him. And they replaced him with the Shah. So uh, basically, what is it that the West can do, if anything, um, to, to actually aid genuine democracy in the West? Uh, and do they really want democracy? Which, which country are you talking about here? Iran. 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 
So the question is, it's a great question, if I may say, I wish I'd stolen it from you. What can the West do to aid genuine democracy in the Middle East? That's your question. Let's start with you, Jane. Let's hear an answer from everyone to that question, and you're next. I think the transitions in Tunisia and Egypt are potentially a great opportunity for the West to offer genuine support to real democratic transitions, uh, both through providing some measures of, of uh, political support, training, legal advice, etc., help finding the assets, perhaps economic support. Um, debt relief's already been mentioned, but there seems in Egypt to be particular demand for investments and for gar guarantees, underwriting of investments that would create jobs. Jobs is going to be absolutely key to Egypt's success. I do very much hope uh, that, that Western policymakers do take that opportunity and don't decide that they fear the Muslim Brotherhood so much that they would prefer to support another kind of disguised military government. I think the question about what the West can do to support democracy in Iran is much harder uh, because clearly the main strategy that the regime used to try to discredit protesters in the past in terms of <coughs> narratives and propaganda was to say that it was all British plus American plus Israeli conspiracy. So I think that I'm not an Iran specialist, but I think there is a big question around whether Western support for alternative movements in Iran does them any good at all. Um, I think that, first of all, um, I wouldn't be supportive of democratization. I'd be supportive of liberalization. That was the flaw of the Bush administration because democratization is a culmination of a multi-generational process. Um, start with liberalization. Um, Bernard Lewis had the most fascinating interview in the Wall Street Journal when he spoke about um, how um, classical Islam um, had a uh, a system of co um, consultations that in Arabic there's no word for democracy they have justice and they have consultations and why should we impose a Western style democracy on the Middle East um, and there doesn't need to necessarily be a class of, clash of civilizations if consultations are working in sync with Western democracies um, I think we should be funding opposition groups not having the minimal funds that the Bush administration did, which was slashed by the Obama administration. Uh, so we should be doing a lot more to foster liberalization by funding opposition groups. And I wouldn't have a problem with regime change itself, simply due to the nuclear threat and their um, sponsorship of terrorism around the world, not simply the Middle East. Um, I don't think that targeting the regime would cause the opposition to coalesce around the regime in, in opposition to the West. I don't buy that logic. There is a law of unintended consequences, but that's bizarre, let alone unintended. No, I think the best thing we do, I, I agree with Jane, is to, is to look, look at Egypt. I think there's a real opportunity in Egypt. I know quite a lot, lot of Egyptians, and I've been impressed by the way the, the older generation, including uh, top generals, have really accepted the fact that, uh, that, that the revolution has happened. Everybody's now a revolutionary. They mean different things by it, but we have to help them to get through, uh, do what we can to, to help them to, to, to make that concrete through the constitutional changes, etc. Elsewhere, it's a question of trying to work where we can, where, where, the, where, the, where the opportunities, uh, which, uh, opportunities come up. A lot, I think, British aid at the moment is directed to things like uh, helping to improve the rule of law, helping parliamentary systems, helping NGOs, etc. This, this is the sort of thing that, that, that can continue. But, but Otherwise, it'll be opportunities that crop up. But Israel's not a democracy today, is it? Why? Why is it? It's run by the army. There's no women running the. There's no women running the country. Israel. No, I beg your pardon. I'm Egypt. 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 Sorry. Egypt. Yes, but there are plenty of women in Egyptian politics. That's actually a good question for now. We will obviously have to come to Israel. No, there are. Egypt's not a democracy now, is it? No, no. It's on. It's going towards it. It's going towards it, and it's going to require. It'll be several years. I'm leaving you out for this. Did you get an answer to your question? I was going to say just very briefly in response to that, the problem is that as soon as the West is funding any opposition groups, there's yes, no trust. True. You don't trust them to have genuine intentions. You think they're going to be a stooge, they have an agenda. And it's, I think they've lost the trust of the people and it's a question of regaining the trust. I think they never had the trust of the people because regimes were always inculcating the masses against external enemies in order to legitimize their rule. Um, if you actually see what's happened with the oppositions in Egypt, for example, you've not heard really any anti-Western rhetoric okay. from the we'll come back to protesters. That's striking. Move on. Man in tie, then woman at back. 
Thank you. My, my name is Hossam. I'm from Egypt, and my, my comment is on the superiority point. Um, I, I think it's naive to burden foreign policy with the need to be moral. Foreign policy is practical. Yes. Um, and um, the, the reason that your comments on superiority uh, annoy people is I think that there's an element of truth to them and painful truth. Western, or let's call them democratic countries, uh, walk the tightrope between having to be practical on foreign policy, but also represent their people's morality. Uh, in the Middle East, that has not really been the case, because it's not been in the regime's interest to act always morally. Um, and uh, it, it is precisely that disconnect that made us take to the streets and remove Mubarak and be prepared to run into tear gas and rubber bullets and all the rest of it. And if I have to close on a question, let me ask this. Why are you waiting for Middle Eastern consensus on, on Libya? You're not going to get it. I mean, it's, yes. not, in the, it's not in the regime's interests mm -hmm. yes. to overthrow anybody, because then they're next. But there is a disconnect between what the regimes want and what their people want. And does, the woman who asked the question before you, do millions of people in the Middle East have a problem with what you've just said? In other words, say one thing and mean completely the other. Talk about democracy, but mean our interests. Talk about human rights, but mean trade. Is that all, that's what you want us to do. You, you just be honest about it. I, I think you would get a much more respectful reaction from the Middle East if, if you pursued your interests uh, honestly. On a not not you, obviously. On, okay. a, on a less cynical tone, Bernard Lewis would say that they're not looking for interests; they're looking for justice. They want to have, um, they want to be included in processes and decision-making processes, and they want to just be able to buy food. That's basic justice. And you at the back, uh, Jenny Taylor from Lapido Media. Um, as I understand it, liberalisation, um, you mean the liberalisation of freedom of conscience and freedom of speech, the kinds of things that are the basis of democracy. Why does this government not do what America did in 1998 and introduce the Freedom of Religion Act that has to be observed in all uh, giving of aid and all trade agreements? Why, for example, in Pakistan have we given 450 million uh, in, in grants to Pakistan without any conditionality on freedom of conscience? I don't know how the law in question works, but certainly the US is content to be selling $60 billion worth of arms to Saudi Arabia, where freedom of religion is not even pretended to be practiced. Well, it's obviously a slow process, but uh, you've got to start. You've got to well, it's start. obviously a very big figure, isn't it? That's a, no, you, but the direction but, it, but it's better to have Arabia. an act than no act at all. OK, well, uh, thank you for raising it. Uh, I'm going to start moving us on, if I may. Uh, uh, Noel, did you want to comment on the lady's remark? No, I was, I was going to say that the, 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 the US does actually produce every year a, a report on this. It certainly names Saudi Arabia amongst other countries uh, for their um, say religious freedom. OK, so we've got about 10 minutes left, uh, and we're coming to you next, to you now. Can, can I just ask you to make a distinction what you mean between promoting liberalisation and um, democracy? If you, talk, if you look at the societies, the societies in um, places like Egypt and Libya, um, you are looking at quite liberalised um, uh, communities and societies. Um, another point which you mentioned about... Okay, let's just break. That's fine. What's the difference between liberalisation and democratisation? Okay. Um, democratisation is active participation. It's just the oversimplistic version. Democratisation is active participation in a process. Liberalisation is freedom from government exposure. A phenomenal book that I read very recently, and I wish I would have read it a decade ago, was Fareed Zakari's Fre uh, Future of Freedom, where he actually does speak about the distinction between liberalisation and democratisation, and this was something that the Bush administration clearly didn't understand. Yeah, OK, can, can I just pick up on another point that you made about what the West can do to um, promote this? Um, you mentioned the nuclear threat in the Middle East, and I think it's quite clear everyone understands who the biggest um, nuclear threat in the Middle East is and has been for several decades. Um, is Israel, that? obviously. Um, the second point that I wanted to make um, as a gesture, obviously the communities there and the populations there, after um, reaching such um, a stage by the revolutions, um, looking to the West and what they want to offer, they want to see actual um, tangible steps being taken. So for example, do you, um, how do you look at the assets that have been frozen by um, the Western governments of the corrupt regimes and um, nothing has been done about them? Mm. Um, well, the people you talk about justice, the people are looking for those. 
Okay. In France. There's, an, there's a huge meal there. You, you're worth an evening on your own. Mm. So, I mean, I'll just, you know, you, bear with me, though. Yeah, you, sure. Can you take the question of Israel nuclear? Jane, can you take the question of uh, frozen assets? Mm. And then we're coming to you. Just well, obviously, the, the Israeli democracy isn't a good example to emulate in the Middle East. Obviously, is, is, there is a serious problem with a country that occupies a good number of people and denies them the rights of to be free. So Israel isn't a good example as, at all to look at. But when it comes to democracy in the Middle East, I think we wanted to democratize ourselves, okay, according to our um, beliefs, cultures, and, and our own pace. So it isn't going to be exactly a Western democracy. Uh, democracy is different in this country from the democracy that we have in America uh, when it comes to participation, the political system, and so on. So you know, we, we, we need to do it on our own terms rather than in your terms. Um, I think this point about the assets is really important. I mean, I think people have heard a lot of words in the Middle East and they do want to see actions from the West that proves that the West is going to support these transitions. Um, I imagine that there will be some kind of lobbying against uh, such actions because London is a financial centre where a lot of people that are not democratic are <laughs> stashing their assets. And probably you would find people in the city arguing, hey, if they don't come here, they'll go to Liberia or Switzerland or somewhere else. Um, but I do think politically this is something that the West uh, should pursue and can pursue. I hope that they do. Hi, thank you for taking my question. I'm Cindy Macedo from the Kensington Chelsea Women's Club. It's an international women's club. I'd like to address my question to Jane from Chatham House and also the gentleman from Benghazi. Um, okay, granted that um, because of something that came out in the WikiLeaks um, uh, State Department documents, Tuna, tuna leaks be, became uh, uh, a big um, influence in the turning of the people in Tunisia. Did you expect that this was going to happen in Libya? Did you, in the Chatham House, know that this was going to happen like dominoes? And why weren't the intelligence of the United Kingdom, of the United States, um, prepared. I mean, they don't seem to be prepared. Why was everybody taken by surprise all of a sudden? I think um, very th probably nobody a year ago would have predicted a revolution in Tunisia. The possibility of a revolution in Egypt was certainly already being discussed both by intelligence and by the many businesses that exist in the country because there was already a concern about the presidential succession. But Tunisia, no. Um, a colleague of mine from my, my previous job, the Economist Intelligence Unit, was into Tunisia in early December, uh, meeting probably with, with the French cabinet. Meeting with <laughs> meeting with opposition parties who didn't expect a revolution yeah. to happen. It, this is one of the most uh, heavily under surveillance societies in the Middle East, with a real police state. So the revolution, in a way, was only successful because people didn't know about it. Because this wasn't the traditional opposition movements. This was something that organised in a different way, and therefore wasn't stopped by Tunisian intelligence. Uh, but I think there is a, a lot of uncertainty now within West and policy circles about what this all means and, and where they go next. But uh, well, do you agree that WikiLeaks has um, provoked what happened in Tunisia? I don't, actually. I think it's more people's everyday experience of corruption, where, they're expect where they were expected to be bribing the police on a routine basis. I think WikiLeaks probably confirmed to people what they already knew. Well, I, in the Libyan situation, I didn't think the WikiLeaks has any link, to, has any uh, role to play in it. But interestingly enough, the Libyan revolution was due to start in the 17th by youngsters, people who use Facebook, Twitter, and so on. But actually, started in the 15th by women, by Arab women, who came out at night, 10 o'clock at night, when they heard that the lawyer who was representing their loved ones who were massacred in the Abu Salim prison back in 1996, and they just took it upon themselves. They came out in the middle of the night, around 10 o'clock at night and they headed for the security headquarters and they freed the man actually, Fathi Turbul, who's the lawyer and as they walked with him, they just chanted uh, for Benghazi to come out and the revolution started and this is something we are really proud of. I have questions about Israel or what's so called uh, Israeli democracy. If we take on board that Israel is the democratic <coughs> island or democratic oasis in the desert of tyranny and dictatorship today if tomorrow um, the Arab world becomes democratic and liberal, um, how can we look at Israel by then? Okay, but you two in the middle. I think that um, if the Arab world 
became democratic tomorrow, there'd be the heightened chance of peace between Israel and its neighbors. Um, currently, Israel has no... No way. I, <laughs> as, as, as long as Israel has the, the, the Palestinian question unanswered, okay, let, but, there'll um, be no peace. But, um, why should the... Why, why would the Israelis have confidence in making peace with any Arab leader who are here today and possibly not here tomorrow? We know, for example, that Mubarak, you know, he had a 30-year cold peace with Israel, right? And because now Israel, we, wait, okay. let me finish my point. Okay, briefly. Now and now we see that the future leadership isn't really embracing the peace treaty with Israel. So. There's a distinction. Well, I, I, I did think there would be peace with Israel as long as uh, Israel behaves the, the way it behaves. I mean, now we've seen the last uh, act that the Israeli parliament has just passed by by withdrawing nationality from the Arab Israelis for being accused of being uh, uh, pro-terrorist or whatever. No, I, I, I didn't think this is going to go forward. Yes, I mean, I, I think as I say, it's not it's not the question of, of, of democracy or not. It's the, it's the actual issues. I think will be the important thing. Um, at, um, yeah. Yeah. A, future, a, a previous Israeli president was sentenced to prison, right, by an Israeli Arab judge for sexual harassment. Where would you see that well, in the Arab rapist. world? He's a rapist. Where would you he see should, that? Should, he should be stabbed to death, to me. You know. You know. We'll, st we'll start with the panel. We'll start with the panel. Uh, the, 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 well, well, I was going to say is that, I mean, to answer it's, it's the point earlier, I mean, the, the, the peace mm -hmm. treaty with Israel was signed by Sadat uh, and maintained by Mubarak. And I'm pretty sure the, the, the army, you know, it's such a strategic issue for Egypt. It, it, it may change eventually, but it won't change. And the, the peace treaty with Jordan uh, was signed with King Hussein and been, been maintained by King Abdullah. So you can have changes of leaders, and, the, and it continues. Oh, Jane, the, 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 well, you know, the audience is very interested in discussing Israel, mm. so we'll, let's mm. make five minutes, and then we'll, we'll, we'll be ending after this five minutes. Mm. What challenges are there for Israel from this Arab Spring and the West's response to it? I think the, the loss of Mubarak has been a, a big shock um, to Israel. I think there is a good argument that peace between peoples is better and more sustainable, but the idea of that happening tomorrow is also going to be extremely difficult. So far, I don't see an indication that um, you, you might imagine this would be a time for Israel to move more rapidly to a peace agreement. I don't see an indication that the Sikh government is um, is keen to do that. Um, I think that the issue of democracy is a bit of a red herring because I think Israel is a democratic country in itself, obviously not in the occupied territories, but democracy doesn't, does, it clearly doesn't solve uh, all the problems. Um, I think that, in fact, uh, the relationship with Egypt is unlikely to change very dramatically for the time being, especially with the Egyptian military still in charge. I do think if we see a continued heating up of the tensions in Gaza, uh, that could be quite a, a serious flashpoint. No, I think well, it, one effect will be it'll mean that uh, Israel has to deal with the regime, with with the people, the whole government, the whole society, rather than regimes. It's one thing to a peace treaty, and it's to, make, to help your point with a leader, but you know, they'll now have to much much harder to persuade parliaments Societies. and people and public opinion to, to back it, which will require changes in Israel's policy. I think. Okay, new question, and we're countering to a conclusion. Mine with glasses. Yeah, okay. I had a few comments actually. Um, I'm from Tunisia, Omar Ben Yedda. So uh, welcome. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, well, but you know, no, this, you know the same. It's ironic the Egyptians are walking like Tunisians. You've heard that before, haven't you? <laughs> but uh, no, a, few, uh, a few points. Number one about Libya. Actually, people have mentioned oil. Yeah, possibly there may, oil may be a consideration, but Western companies were doing quite well under Gaddafi, so I don't think oil was uh, was as big a part as uh, as people as people may think or imply. Secondly, we were actually very happy in Tunisia that there was no foreign intervention, and we were happy that the French made foreign policy mistakes during the uh, during the revolution to actually claim that it was our revolution and that no one would have the upper hand on what we were going to do. Saying that, I would like to tell my Libyan friend that post-revolution, actually, the vacuum created has created a lot of uncertainty and we I mean I'm confident although I know that some of my Tunisian friends are less confident but we saw a lot of solidarity, we saw a lot of organization, but then we also saw a lot of chaos a few weeks after the revolution. So it's a lot harder than, uh, the, than what it appears. And one of the problems with actually foreign policy, I feel that in the UK, we're not, 
I said, I'm, I'm actually half, well, I'm British passport and, to, and Tunisian. So, uh, so, I, so, so I see foreign UK foreign policy as partly my foreign policy. But, uh, but I find that there's a big naivety about, uh, about and lack of knowledge about the societies which we're entering in, in terms of foreign policy. Okay. Whether, and, uh, and my actually comment about, uh, about Israel, just one very simple comment. The Arab street, the Arab street, so it's more importantly, because if we are going to free the Arab street, the Arab street want justice. So in terms of foreign policy, I think they'll be a lot less clement than the, uh, the regimes are with Israel at the moment. And would you just admit, were you surprised at what happened in Tunisia? Oh, we were, we were all surprised at what happened in Tunisia. And what happened in Tunisia wasn't, uh, wasn't about WikiLeaks and it wasn't about Al Jazeera. Okay. It was about the people, actually. Thanks very much. So, uh, panel, can you now give us your closing thoughts and answer this question as well? Given everything you've said tonight, one of the first questions on the website that everyone paid £10 for to get in, I might add, was <laughs> how much of an influence can the West expect to have now in the Middle East? So would you answer that and give us your closing thoughts in a couple of minutes each and then we'll, then we'll all let you go? I think Western influence in the Middle East uh, has been diminished recently. Um, I think the, the strong Western backing for regimes that have fallen is one problem. I think the economic outlook for the Western countries is also a problem. I think there, is, uh, there are a lot of people in the Middle East who are buying into the idea that economic power is shifting more and more towards um, Asia and that Europe and the US are kind of less will be less important in the world in the future. Um, I think that there is a, a good opportunity for the West to actually try to stand up for the values it claims to have around democracy and human rights, and that that could uh, make perhaps the, the US and Europe more attractive allies than a China that, for instance, doesn't care about these things. Um, but that will depend on a lot of policy changes from the Western governments. I'm not yet certain that we are going to see these things happen. Um, I think that, um, that it's much easier to encourage um, the instigation of revolution, change, regime change. Um, it's much harder to, in a sustained manner, engage with opposition groups and um, foster change. I think this is one of the reasons why in Yemen mm -hmm. the United States sorted to have a dereliction of its responsibility and just rely on the president rather than seek opposition groups that it could engage in for sustainable change. Um, and I think that um, Rather than relying on short-term stability, we can have a. We, we should be focused on a much more long-term transformational approach, and in turn foster liberalisation. Let's not go for the ballot boxes yet. Yeah. Multi-generational process. Yes, I think a specific issue of, of Yemen. It's, it was a focus on Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula and the terrorist threat, which has perhaps distorted people's uh, uh, assessment of what mm. the, the real problems in, 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 in Yemen were. Um, I, all I really get to say at the end is what well, I said at the beginning: you know, foreign policy is essentially a, 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 a mixture of, of interest and, uh, and values, practicality, and resources, allies, a, a consensus of people in the region. And I think we, we cannot uh, think that the, the, the you know, what we've seen in Tunisia and Egypt will necessarily be repeated in that way in, in the other countries in the region. I think it'll, we're going to see a lot of different different uh, scenarios and different tra tra trajectories. And in some places, it'll be very, very slow. And a lot of different responses from and the West. And different responses. And it's also, also worth remembering, no one's mentioned it, there is actually a sort of reasonably freely elected parliament in Kuwait, which has been functioning for the last 20 years. Um, so there are, there are examples of Lebanon as well. And, and Lebanon, yes. Lebanon. Mm -hmm. I, I think the, uh, the, the Arab world is going to be uh, democratic. Uh, democracy is reigning throughout the Arab world. And uh, I think the, uh, the discourse of superiority and the language of diktat from the West, I think this has to finish now, because now it's people dealing with people. And we will be electing our own representative rather than having despotic regimes imposed on us and sustained by the West. Uh, uh, the, the other important thing, I think, uh, it's a, a unique opportunity to strike uh, a strategic partnership between the Middle East and Europe, because we are neighbors, but also we have plenty to give to each other. And there's one piece of unfinished business. I cut you off halfway through, and I wonder if you, because this is a meeting devoted to the audience, would you have the final question or word? Because we've got two minutes left. Sorry, just I have comment. I'm Libyan. First about the, the, the foreign intervention in Libya. 
Uh, I don't think it will happen in other countries because uh, Gaddafi started the foreign intervention and the Libyan people ask UN to help them. So it's a uh, backward story, it's not, it's not straightforward case. Mm -hmm. This first. Second, about the democracy in uh, history in Libya. Yes, we have democracy and we try. First Republic in Middle East and Third World, it was in Libya, 1918, by, in, in Tripolitania. Mm. So this is a very important point. Uh, about blaming the West, I don't think we should blame the West because uh, dealing with, with dictatorship because they are, they are protecting their interest. Mm. And I hope my country one day will protect our interest and deal with everybody the same way. Um, <laughs> about Israel and if it's open, Israel, yes, open for peace. Peace or prize, I'm Libyan to say that. That's why they're supporting Gaddafi and sell, selling weapon, And that's why the Minister of Defense refused to answer the question how Israel is involving and intervening uh, with Gaddafi. Okay. Just, okay. just to rejoin, to, can, can, you, I've heard you both echo each other on this point. I've just not seen a source anywhere. And I'd be very appreciative no, we've, if you we've could. We've seen weapons that has Israeli is scripts yeah. and the, uh, the okay. Star of David and so on. Okay, Let's ha mm. the, 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 this question really needs to be its own topic. I, I know pe people in the audience want us to go on, but I'm, we, you have to do it after the meeting closes because it's, it's 8.29. We started a minute late. We're going to end a minute early. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that's just the rules. But but uh, I'd like to thank the panel very much indeed. I'm, I'm sorry if your whole area of specialty has been reduced to minutes at a time, but <laughs> listening to you, I've learned a lot. I enjoyed the arguments, and I know it's not finished. But we came in to discuss foreign policy. We've heard it debated. We came in for a briefing on specific countries. You've all told us, don't just put them together, Syria, Yemen, Bahrain. Mm. Treat them as their own. That was a very important message, and you've got to tell us that as well. So thank you very much. And to you as well, everyone in the audience, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.